Uh, we have joining us today, as always, well, most of the time, uh, our resident criminal guy. defense attorney, Damon Parrish, Esquire. Uh, my main man with all the chemical and mechanical engineering skills, Quentin Broadwater. And the doc with the most to offer, Dr. Rod Singleton. How are you, fellas? All right, cool. So, jumping right on into this, um, U.S. population is changing. Uh, you know, we we live in a very um, tumultuous, racially tumultuous time, and one of the issues that we continue to see is that it seems with our new president, uh, we're making a backwards leap in time. Uh, they just did a uh, census projection uh, not too long ago. It says that the uh, white majority will become a, mi a white minority in as little as 2045. Whites are going to comprise about 49% of the population. Uh, Hispanics will be 24.6% and blacks will be 13.1%, Asian 7.8% and 3.8% for the uh, miscellaneous extra. Um, it's interesting because what we're, what we're starting to see now is, is I think a lot of um, white cultural uh, fear uh, and I think that that is what's kind of promulgating a lot of the the uh, decisions that are coming down the immigration decisions that are coming down um, some of the some of the other issues that we're having in this country all arise from the fear that the majority will no longer be as powerful as they once were is this something we need to be afraid of as minorities um, and, and when I say, what, what, what are you talking about in terms of afraid? Or do we need to be afraid of the retribution of the majority in turning into my, a minority? All right. So first, uh, the majority is not turning into the minority. They're just losing. They're, they're not even losing the majority. They're, losing they're just losing the ground on the majority. And it's to the pool of minorities. I mean, there's no single minority that can, that can even come close to the majority of this country, right? But the pool of minorities coming together, they're losing ground to what you're talking about, in my opinion, sounds like uh, a challenge to privilege and to the status quo. Anytime you challenge those two things, you will have a problem. Now, uh, on the other side, that assumes one thing. It assumes that the white majority is all on board with the privilege, all on board with the status quo, and, and also, as a majority, majority, you don't want it changed. And I don't think that's the truth. I don't believe that to be the truth as well. I think uh, there are a lot of people, both white, black, Hispanic, whatever, that are seeking unity, that aren't div divisive, and within that white majority, I highly doubt all 49% are anti-change. I don't doubt, I, I, I doubt that. You know, one thing that Rod said in another show, um, he was upset with the uh, black minority uh, fighting so much for other minorities' civil rights when we should be more focused on our own. Um, Rod, do you think that with the onset of, of more minorities coming into the picture and growing as a collective, that this might be one reason why we should be fighting for the minority collective just as much as we fight for the for the black minority? So, text without context is pretext. And I think that was not contextualized appropriately what I said. Um, what, I meant, what I meant by what I said was that it seems to be a little, a little bit of some hypocrisy when we see other people uh, in, in mass and bay against, you know, what's going on with other minority groups, or other protected groups, uh, with respect to the immigration issue that we have at, at hand right now. That was what that, that, that statement was made in context to. And what I meant by that is that we devote a lot of our time, you know, black people are compassionate people. We, de we devote a lot of our time to other people's causes, but we don't seem to have the same reciprocity when it comes to, you know, the issues that afflict our community. Uh, um, you know, you don't see you know, the, the amount of outcry when, you know, black kids get killed with impunity by the police. Uh, you, see, you see it, but you don't see it to the level that you hear the crescendo of, you know, anti-immigration, the anti-anti-immigration sentiment or anti-Semitic, anti-anti-Semitism or other, you know, types of uh, isms is what I was saying. I just think there needs to be a commensurate response for other groups when it pertains to our causes. I didn't say that we shouldn't fight for other people's causes. I, I feel like they should have you know, the same kind of fervor to, to, when they address those uh, issues of other folks that they should, they should have with us. That's what I meant by that. So one of the things that's, uh, that's happening right now is that uh, the president's party has uh, decided that they are going to, they've been quietly discharging immigrants uh, from the uh, armed forces. 
And you know, this is happening. I mean, these are some high level people that, that are, are well, not high level, all, all high level people, but these are uh, special recruits uh, that, have, that, have, that have been quietly discharged from, from the service, um, all in the hopes of them fortifying themselves as American citizens. Um, do you think we, we've gone too far in our witch hunt for immigration to put a stranglehold on, on immigration? Man, absolutely. Why would you, like, what's the point of going as far as, um, you know, booting people away from the military service? I mean, these people, that that was their way of getting there. I, I doubt any of them would have signed up for that if they would have thought that at some point that they wouldn't be able to achieve the goal of becoming a citizen. So now you may create... You may create these terrorists or whatever it is that you're in fear of by doing this. You may create exactly what you're trying to prevent from happening. Mm. Like almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Like, okay, I, I put in all this blood, sweat, and tears, but now you're going to take the opportunity away from me. And what do I do now? Not, not to mention you have given me military training. Exactly. So you taught me how to shoot a gun, how to <laughs> you build taught a bomb, me how to come back and kill you, how to survive in the in the jungle and the streets and whatnot. You taught me warfare. Exactly. That's a good point. This, I mean, this is straight out of this administration's playbook. I don't. I wasn't surprised by what it, that it happened. I'm more surprised by the the continual blatant hypocrisy of this administration, harping on patriotism and service, and yet some of these people who've been draft dodgers, Donald Trump himself, people who've never served the country, only thing they've done is take from the country. You know, those are the people who you know this 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 is flabbergasting to me. <laughs> Like the nerve of these people, the unmitigated gall of these people. So Raphael McCary uh, said that none of the other minorities want to sully their hands with our cause, with our causes. They're all vying for that number one minority spot. Are are we really minority crabs in a bucket? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't think. I don't think I, we are. I, and I think that speaks to what Rod spoke to earlier when he talked about how black people always want to rush to the aid of somebody else, but. Very rarely do you see people doing that for us. Now, I think, uh, I mean, you can, you can see it. When you go to different places, you see how everybody sets up their block, their corner, and they take care of themselves. So I believe to some people, yeah, it is a, it is a race to the top. But, um, or a race to the bottom. Or, 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 or <laughs> yeah, whichever direction you're going, right? But I don't think it should be that. I think at the end of the day, everybody, culturally, you're going to have, you should you know, embrace those, and, and yeah, you should build your own communities. Look to build and strengthen your own cultures. Um, but at some point, everybody's going to have to come together and work together, right? Because we all present different skills, we all present different talents and all those things. So we should be strengthening our own individual cultures, but at the same time, learning to work together to build, you know, that one community that is, I mean, America's headed to that, man. The problem is I agree, right? I, I, ideally, this would be a kumbaya, and then everybody would get along, regardless of your race, ethnicity, creed, whatever. But we have an endless amount of talent and a paucity of opportunity. So as long as that's the case, you're going to have people vying for opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And you're going to have these, I, w I don't want to say clashes, but you're going to have the, this, this, this kind of schism between all of these different uh, minority groups. And it's just something I feel is unavoidable. You know? It I mean, is, but you know what, and, and, all, and, and you're right, but... I mean, I mean, how long have we been working like that, right? For years, right? It's, it's, as long as people have been coming to this country and, and trying to, you know, achieve, uh, you know, the American dream, you know, it's, it's this culture versus this culture versus that culture. And nobody has gained any ground as far as um, real political power to actually go in and actually drive a change. So it's almost like we're being played like puppets. Like, we're going to make it look like y'all winning and achieving, but we gonna, you know, you got this invisible wall right here. You ain't gonna go no further than, than Bel Air. You ain't gonna go no further than the third ward or the fifth ward or whatever, right? Fair enough. That's Houston reference. Um, so, so piggybacking on this whole this whole racial issue, I'm gonna tap on something uh, that that that's gonna lead to a bigger discussion uh, dealing with collegiate issues. But the Trump administration uh, is moving forward with uh, taking a hard line position against affirmative action uh, in schools, uh, saying that they, are, they no longer want um, to use racial demographics as a measurement of diversity in education. Um, and, and, you know, with the new, uh, or not the new, with Justice Kennedy uh, getting ready to, to retire, we've got another case that's about to go 
uh, spearhead its way through uh, the Supreme Court, where uh, uh, Harvard is pit pitted against Asian Americans, and there's an Asian American lawsuit saying that they are underrepresented and they are being excluded because of um, because of their, their 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 racial makeup, and white conservatives are saying, "Hey, we're being discriminated against because of our color." by forcing affirmative action. Um, So-called reverse discrimination. Well, well, reverse discrimination. I mean, so first and foremost, is, is uh, affirmative action an antiquated I ideology? Emphatically, no. Okay. Not even, not even a little bit. Not even a little bit. And is there some merit to the argument that others are excluded to their detriment um, for our benefit? Yes, but there's nothing wrong with that. Like I, 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 I get, I get where those people are coming from. I understand completely. However, you, you have, a, you have a system, and I, there was this, there was this picture I saw when there were three guys standing. All right, and it was three different barrel lengths. It's hard to describe it, but the whole thing is there's a, a concept of equality versus equity. All right, what is fair, equal across the board, and what is fair. Now there is a, there is, is. is a, a understood schism or split that most minorities are started behind the ball. That invisible wall we speak of. That we are we're started at a place that's less than. Our schools don't get as much money. So from educational purposes, we don't grow as faster. We're not giving us access to much resources. So we have to fight harder just to reach that level. Um, to make it equitable and fair, yes, you should allow us to, hey, we want diversity, let's have more of this. I mean, schools can, dis can discriminate you on intelligence, they can have a diversity of intelligence. They can have a diversity on athletics, on athletic skill. Why not a diversity? They can have a diversity in sexual preference, right? Why not a diversity in in minority of uh, 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 people of minority people of color or religious backgrounds to have a school that's that's more mixed and not homogenized? So, do you think some of these other minorities and and and, and Quentin, you can answer this question. Do you think other minorities are already starting out at a greater advantage than African Americans, or should the should the affirmative action a uh, platform be be a minority in total and not more specific to the African American community. No, I mean, but okay. So the first thing is you got to look at how do, how we got here, and we got here by discriminating, uh, not allowing people to have an opportunity to, to get here. So to me, affirmative action it addresses that, right? It, it gives you a platform to get to get to these opportunities so that you can change. Um, you can't change what's happened over the past, so I feel like you have to have it. But yeah, I think I think there should be some type of criteria, whether it be percentage based or or what, to say, you know, you need to get afford this this many people from this culture an opportunity at least to uh, to go to Harvard or to get this job or to get this intern program. Because if you don't, man, it's so, everything is so dominated by white America. How are you going to ever get your foot in the door? So, and Rod answered this one, um, Clinton Myers says that uh, white women benefit more uh, from affirmative action, and I think the dot, dot, dot to that is they benefit more than any other minority group. Um, do you think that affirmative action is not actually protecting or benefiting the people that it was intended to benefit the most? Uh, I don't know the data on white women, but I can tell you an example of, yes, why I do agree with that. And, and, I, and, I, and I love my, my Niger people and my Yoruba people and my Igbo people. I love y'all. But if you look at some of the affirmative action policies that were promulgated with the intent of rectifying or addressing the, the wrongs that were uh, uh, exacted against the African-American community, those who were descendants of slaves, right, who had the disadvantage of not having the ability to establish generational wealth, you know, education, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. Now those same, uh, you know, you know, priorities that are, were supposed to be given to us for, for education in some of these schools are now given to some of our counterparts from Africa who are not descendants of slaves per se. And so we're not necessarily reaping the benefits of policies that were intended to benefit us. And I know it's a little controversial, but affirmative action doesn't just benefit, you know, African Americans. And I also say that the, the, the leading, you know, the, the leading opposition against affirmative action is predicated on a fallacious notion that a rising tide does lift all boats, and I, I disagree with that fundamentally. There's, there needs to be a tailored solution to African American people because there was an injustice, a specific injustice inflicted upon our community yeah. that led to where we are today. So it requires a more, you know, tailored solution. So I, I take umbrage to anybody who says that, oh, you know, we just, you know, it, it's, 
you know, there's no perfect solution. There's going to be some people who, you know, but fall but, by the wayside. But what about the argument that, you know, obviously um, African Americans um, hold a hold a special place in America as the quote unquote bottom of the bottom of the rung uh, uh, sub subgroup. However, women have traditionally been right there with us, if not below us, when we talk about disparity um, within pay, within within uh, uh, social equanimity. So, when you talk about something saying that it should be specific to the black community, are we really doing a disservice to other subgroups that could that that should be benefiting just as much as the black subgroup? Uh, as a populace, maybe I'm sure that we, I'm sure that happens, right? But a lot of those group, or minority groups, come to America not straddled with the the legacy, the the mental economic legacy of slavery. So a lot of those people do come. We, we're going to touch on this in another segment, but they come over here already, you know, primed to you know take advantage of all American opportunities because you know they weren't denied those things, the foundation for those things in their country that they came from. Yeah. So it's not that simple. It's not that America is a very unique. Problem. The race is a unique problem in America. Yeah. It requires a very unique solution. I tell you, I tell you that, and and exactly what he's saying. If you want affirmative action to be effective, and you want it to work, you're gonna have to define it specifically to the subgroup or the specific group or person, people that you want it to benefit from. So you, like, when you go out and shop for a car, you don't just tell the people, "Hey, I want a car." You tell them what kind of car you want, because if you don't tell them that then you're going to get whatever they bring back to you, right? And it might not work for you. So to me, like a lot of policies, they're not defined well enough to actually improve the situation that it was intended to improve. So, And and a lot of that needs to, you know, political people, they need to go back and they need to fight for that. They need to say, this group has not benefited. This group, we have not seen what we wanted to see from this. So we need to go back and redefine it so that it actually improves um this group of people or this person, whether it be women, uh, men, young black boys, young black, whatever, whatever it is that we want to see improve, it needs to be defined and tailored to actually make an impact in that area. So as we move on to the to the next part of the show, I want to do a PSA real quick. I know uh, many of y'all are probably seeing the little uh, chocolate drop that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> running around this, uh, this the, the work room. <laughs> so I want to let you know right now. And raising the youth. <laughs> I want to let you know right now that, you know, um, we, we believe in parenthood here at Intelligence. We believe that every parent should have a voice and that every child should have the opportunity to see mom or dad at work. Um, this is Damon Parrish the third, uh, which is Damon Parrish the second's hi. second's son. Say hi. Oh, oh, don't be shy now. You was just <laughs> running around here a second ago. All right. All right. So, uh, so in case you're wondering, well, who who who's that little <laughs> who's that new who's, who's that who's that little shadow running around here? Also, we've uh, over, over the other side we have our amazing uh, producer Andrea Soders. Hi. Um, she behind every great group of men. Is an even greater woman making sure it all runs smoothly. So she makes sure that the uh, that the ship stays on track, and and we're just happy to have her here. So moving forward with this whole affirmative action thing, and as it pertains to universities, this is a question for you guys. So the black athletes in in America, I would say at least ninety five percent of the top athletes go to. Uh, PWIs, predominantly white institutions. You're talking about your D1, your 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 uh, your, your your Big Tens, uh, your Pac Pac Tens, all all your all BCS conference, schools. right? All your BCS yeah, schools. All BCS. These BCS schools literally make billions of dollars per year off the backs of black athletes. Uh, and and when you think about the numbers, on average, um, most of these BCS schools will host two to three percent of their of their student population being African American. Mm -hmm. Their athletic program uh, boasts at least fifty to sixty percent of their athletic program. I mean the disparity there is 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 by and large ridiculous. Um, and and out of that fifty percent fifty or to sixty percent, they're the ones who are usually your starters. Mm -hmm. uh, they're the ones who are driving the, yeah, the media. The right. Those are the ones who are actually driving the booster clubs to give the the millions and hundreds of millions of dollars they give each year, and they're the ones who are driving uh, media to pay out these multi multi 
uh, hundred million dollar contracts to these schools. Why is it that we can't get black athletes into the HBCUs, which is the historically black colleges and universities? And and should we be doing more to try to, to try to push them and entice them into these HBCUs? I mean, the, the reason why right now HBCUs aren't winning uh, is because they don't have the finances to 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 be able to support these type of players. But Logic would say, hey, if we're able to get the, the black athletes into the HBCU program, then those dollars that were at the PWIs are going to automatically uh, shift themselves over to the HBCUs, which will then in turn uh, give the HBCUs more resources to build better programming, uh, to, to have better facilities. And I mean, these black athletes, they're not, it's not like they're not going to be great regardless of where they go. What, what do we need to do? What's the problem? Wait, wait. All I was going to say is uh, when it comes to the athletes, it's all about access. If your goal is to go to the NBA or NFL as a black athlete, then I'm sorry, you're not going to get that path at TSU. I love TSU. But U of H, right across the street, will give you a better path. Uh, if your goal is to go, uh, UT will give you that path. But I'm, I am sorry, uh, Houston Tillerson down in Austin won't give you that path. Well, for now, well, that's what I'm saying. If, you, if, you're, if you're putting those yeah. same cats in a black school, yeah, cause it's cause going to force you, them. You're comparing, uh, you're comparing what TSU probably on average gets now is a two- to three-star athlete versus a, a four- to five-star athlete, which the path for those two different athletes is going to be different regardless of where they go to school. But – the way I see it here is this. I, I really, honestly, I don't think it's the athlete's fault. And I really don't think it's the school's fault. It's the community's fault. The one the one thing that HBCUs don't have that PWIs have is community backing. When you go to UT, Texas A&M, it's 80,000, 100,000 fans at these games every weekend. And, and, the, and the, what's even sadder is some of those people didn't even go to, didn't even go to these schools. They just... Are local residents that live in these areas, and they take their money and they go to the school and support it. And you go to TSU TSU game. Have, do, does anybody in this room have season tickets to TSU? No, no. So if 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 if, if you so I, I don't I don't want to call any young athletes out because when when you get recruited and, and and you've been in this position, you understand it. I'm coming from the projects. And you want me to go to the projects again. Right. You're not going to come to the game. Right. You're not going to put no money in my pocket while I'm there. But you're going you're gonna to bitch and complain that I went to UT instead of going to uh, TSU. What you ought to do is everybody in the Houston area needs to be at TSU Stadium on Saturday yelling and screaming whether they go 0-12 or whether they go 12-0. and And then that four-star athlete, he, when he go take his campus tour and he take his visit there, it may inspire him to go there, but but for right now, you you can't blame the athlete or you can't blame you can't blame the athlete or you can't blame the school because the community won't get behind the school and support the school and come to the games and donate money and and be those boosters that UT and Texas A and M and all these other schools have. All right, Ron, Ron has been chomping at the bits, <laughs> stressing out. I see a little foam dribbling down his mouth. Speak on it, man. First of all, I, I love Quentin, y'all. Quentin, I love you, bro. But I wholeheartedly disagree with you. This is a classic chicken versus the egg scenario, right? Which came first, right? You're talking about, you're giving us all the reasons why these predominantly white institutions can fulfill all of their stadium seats and they have boosted support and they have all this funding. You're largely neglecting the fact that that's because of the labor of the black athletes. We're talking about why, how to get them to the black schools in order for that to be the case for African Americans, predominant, predominantly African American schools. I don't listen. This is all about inertia. We have a clear path to being so have self-sustaining universities and colleges that can fund itself, that can bolster the education programs. But we have to be able to overcome the the, the inertia of getting them out of the the you know, the mode of going to these schools that have this legacy of of of, of TV viewership and exposure and all these other things that we've been wearing all these Buckeye jerseys and go, and up. Uh, Predominantly white institution jerseys all our lives. When these but, kids but, see these opportunities to go to school, but this is what exactly they're predicating what, those But that's exactly what I'm saying, Rod. You buy the Michigan jerseys, you buy the North Carolina. Nobody buys the TSU jersey. The TSU, Nobody TSU buys sucks. the T but, 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 but TSU when it, when sucks. Brings in the, but this is the thing. This is the thing which you have to understand. The the money they go and they see the flash and all that, because the people are going to the games. It's been if 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 uh Texas couldn't fill their stadium every weekend. 
You wouldn't see that stuff nowhere. There wouldn't be no TV cameras going down there recording their games. Nobody's going to go to an empty stadium and watch a game if uh, if there's no money, no revenue being uh, turned over down there. If TSU had a full stadium every week, if they had local TV stations coming in there, you remember the University of Houston just recently program just came up. They weren't a they weren't a, a program that was on TV week in and week out. Just recently, they are they are nationally televised powerhouse. Is that a PWI? So so yeah. the. Yeah, it is a PWI, but that's what I'm. That's my argument saying they have not always been in the position that they are in now. So the concept of the uh, black collegiate athlete being the star that's a, that's relatively new. You look at UT from 1900 its inception to about 50 60. It was largely a white university with largely a white basketball squad and football squad, and still they sold out. I agree with you, Quentin. Uh, that was supported by the community. Same thing with A and M, and then you have uh, Red McComb who in his will has left an endowment to UT and split to a and system of like hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And, and that's to the school. So you have other uh, alumni uh, boosters, other alumni organizations that support this school even without sports. And we don't do that for HBCUs. We don't do it. We don't support it like that. And maybe There's no reason that TSU, Prairie View, and AM Stadium shouldn't be packed, filled, Every game with with a, with a city like Houston, with a thriving right. black community and professionals like there are here, those stadiums should be packed every weekend. Right. So while I agree with you that that it should be um, um, more patronage, just off off GP, you, let's 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 be real about some of the some of the dynamics that go into sports. Number one, people like to watch winning. You know, if you're not winning, no one wants to sit there and chew, chew, uh, cheer for somebody who's constantly losing. Right. You have to understand that these these HBCUs that you're talking about, they're not. First of all, they're not even D1 schools most of the time. Right. You know, so these no, are these are NC these are these are, these are uh, 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 D2, D3. Um, um, I forget what the our Xavier. I forget what Xavier is, but uh, you know, the, these are yeah. these are schools that are that are D2, D3 swag. schools most of the time. And swag school and, and swag schools. Swag. So so. Winning is, is while we want to win, yeah. we don't have the recruits but to win. Hold on, hold on. We don't have the recruits to win on the same level as the UTs, as, as the OUs, and everybody else. So first and foremost, you have to start with why aren't they watching? Why aren't they coming out? Because they aren't winning. It would be great if we supported ourselves just for the sake of being who we are as black people. But black people don't want to watch. We, we're the hardest on each other as it already stands. So why would that change in any other facet when it comes to competition in sports? Number two. You have to think about the fact that when you think about um, um, athletics, this is the easiest way for, for, I think, blacks or minorities to actually take back some power. It, it literally takes them switching schools. Yeah. Nothing, nothing else yeah. need be done. I don't, like Rod said, this is one of the few times where I'm actually going to agree with Rod, like in, in, probably in, in the larger part of his argument where it's not, you don't really blame the students for this, although you can. Um, you don't even blame the schools for this. You blame the parents because, of, to me, the parents are the most influential people that these, that these college athletes have going from high school into college. Most of the time, if a parent says, hey, son, daughter, I think you should be going here, guess what? That's going to greatly influence where they go. And we have to do more as parents to say to our children, it's just as a, it's just as beneficial to you if you all collectively go to these HBCUs um, to get to the pros, as it would be to go to the OU or the Tech or, or UT. But it would have to take a mass exodus all at the same time because one or two here isn't going to be enough to, to to change the tide right now. But if we start to if 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 half these athletes all of a sudden said, you know what, let's go ahead and uh and, and switch schools right now and go from UT over to Texas Southern, over to Houston Tillotson. Within the next two years, you would have an, uh, uh, you know, time-wise, an instantaneous shift in the dynamics of how football is done. UT would not be a tier one school anymore. It just wouldn't be because they don't. Have, because we have shown that that minority athletes, time and time again, are the prize winners. We we there's literally no. give them money. So there's no for, to show, showcase our talent. There's no disagreement that we are the sport. In basketball, we we are the sport. What what I'm trying to say is, you're saying nobody wants to come see winning. 
when UT went on a drought where they were they were mid tier in the Big Ten in the Big yep, yep. in this conference, but that stadium was still packed every weekend. Absolutely. But when has TSU ever been there though? When has TSU, TSU that, ever been BCS champ? TSU has, they they have never been there. But but this is what I'm saying, Brent. You got to start somewhere because at the end of the day, I could, if 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 my son is six three. 230 pounds and can run a 4240. He's going to make it pro no matter, no matter he where he go. I agree. That's what He's going to make it pro. But me as a parent. I don't agree with that. But me as a parent. Shut up. Bob Hayes. Exactly. But this is the thing. Michael Strait. Me, me as a parent, if if I'm if I'm telling my son, son, go to T, go to TSU, go to South Carolina State, it, you know, those people, they care about you. But then when he gets there, it's 11 people in the stands. Then am, am I not misleading my child? No, you're not. And, because and the, the, the end goal of all of most of these athletes is primarily to get to that next so, professional. So I, I would challenge the I would challenge the community to do this. If if the community got behind some four star athletes and said, you know what, we want y'all to go to TSU, I would also challenge the community to say, all right, buy those season tickets, make a commitment to buy those season tickets, and it's clear out your schedule so you could be at those games, cheering those kids on, buying their jerseys. Um, Donating to the booster clubs so that they get the support that they need, so that TV cameras will come, the the, the scouts will come, they'll get the, the press and everything like these other schools get. Because without that, that's what that's that's what makes a kid go to Alabama, LSU, UT, over going to Prairie View A and M, Alabama A and M. That's that's the difference. The limelight is the difference. While I agree with you on on what would be the best approach in an, in a, in an idealistic world. The reality is, people won't. Do, people, we 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 have shown time and time again. So, so hold on, we've shown time and time again that we are reactionary. You know, so once we get that guy over there, then we'll talk about it. That's that's just what we no, are. No, you know why we won't? Because that guy goes to A and M, UT now, and we still don't go. The black community still doesn't go see Disagree, their own. Adam. No, so, that, if, you're a, if you're at a football school, you go watch football. Let me ask you this: If if the team is forty to fifty percent black, then shouldn't at least the crowd be, like, shouldn't you be able to notice uh, a good amount of black people no, in the crowd? Not, 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 not when not? you're, you're, you're because, because you're student. You're saying that if they go, if, if, if they go, the people will follow them because they're winning. Why are they following them now? Because the student population is 2.3 to 3%. But it's not just Wait, the you're, you're asking the community. Oh, you're asking me the question. The, 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 the most, the, the community. A, a smaller population than the right. whites, a you, part of the community. You're, you're talking about going to Austin. You're most Austin of Austin is smaller than the, than the UT, than the uh, students at UT. So the white, so non black people are going to still support their school at, a, at, at the rate that is commensurate with their population, right? Exactly. And if that's the case, then we're still going to be underrepresented in the stadium. Even if we come and show But the stadium will support. be filled. TSU Stadium is not the same size as UT Stadium. The stadium will be filled. It'll be noisy. It'll be hype. The same atmosphere that you get at UT, you will have it at uh, TSU. It's a smaller stadium. It's a smaller dynamic. But it's a. am telling you, being an athlete on the field, you all know this. When you're on the court or when you're on the field, you know that when you're in a stadium that's filled with fans, it's a it's a mm -hmm. better atmosphere. Yeah. And TV cameras. And I'm sorry. All of that creates the, the, the a better atmosphere. And, and, and I don't think raw talent gets you to the NBA or to pros. It doesn't. No, competition you, you, does. Competition well. breeds it more, and coaching and training breeds it more. So just saying all of our D1 type players go to TSU or whatever, it's not going to solve it because you need now the coaching, the training staff, and the you abilities to me, compete. Me, you need more than just the players. So let me ask you a question. Hold on, let me finish. And, and, and I want to say I can't. I can't tell somebody who's making a path to the pros, and this is their path to UT or whatever, to choose TSU for the people. I'm sorry, I can't say that. I would like for you to, but if you are going to, if your end game is to go pro, and you know you go play for Duke and Coach K, and you will get the spotlight on TV, versus I have no idea what the basketball coach at TSU is, then you're going to go pro. I, I, I can't fault you for that. Well then, I mean, then then we're, we're stuck in this in this vicious yeah, cycle. Then, if you're not willing, if you're not willing to to take the chance on on your own, but you know, you, you talk about matriculating to the uh, to the professional realm, and the hope is once you get there that you make dollar dollar bills. Um, but that simply just isn't the case sometimes, and we and this kind of ties into that discussion. It also ties into the uh, affirmative action issue of women in sports 
generally don't make anywhere near as much as their male counterparts. Specifically, we're talking about the WNBA right now. Uh, one of the, uh, I think it was a rookie player, uh, I think is it, is it Asia or Aja? I don't know. I don't know. How to, is, is, I think it's Asia Wilson. Uh, she went on Twitter uh, talking about, you know, hey, LeBron James signed this $154 million uh, four-year deal with Los Angeles Lakers. It'd be nice if we could just catch a meal. The average uh, paycheck for a um, a, um, a, a, a WNBA player is about seventy-two thousand dollars. They top out at around one hundred and ten thousand um, dollars. It's actually good money. Damn good money. It's really good money. On top of that, their minimum, I think their minimum is about thirty-five thousand uh, dollars a year. Conversely, the uh, average, uh, the the low end of the totem pole for a uh, NBA player is a little bit over five hundred thousand dollars a year, um, with the top players making well over thirty to forty million dollars per year. Um, in addition to that, the NBA uh, CBA, the collective bargaining agreement, has called for now a fifty percent split between players uh, and aggregate, uh, going fifty percent going to the players and aggregate, fifty percent going to the owners, um, while the the average for or the percentage for uh, the WNBA is roughly 20, 26, 22 to twenty six percent of uh, of their total. So people have argued, hey, look, we're not even getting as much as in percentages. We're not even getting as much as the as the NBA players. Personally, I don't think that they should be getting as much as the NBA players right now. One, because this is a revenue driven league. Uh, from the from the NBA side, it's revenue driven. You know, and and let's be let's be real. That 50% hasn't always been 50%. They fought no, to get to 50%. Right, right, right. And they said, hey, we bring in literally billions of dollars. We bring in $5.6 billion a year to the league. Pay us more. Versus the WNBA, who's bringing in probably an aggregate, when you talk about gate sales, uh, merchandising, and everything else, roughly maybe like $55, $60 million per year. I don't see how you how you can compare. You know, I'm all for equality and pay, but this is one of those instances, in my opinion, where it's not about equality and pay. It's about economics and revenue streams. It's 100 percent economics, and in this situation right here, they're going to have to understand you. You eat what you kill. So if you want to make more money, you're going to have to generate more money. Nobody's going to pay you a million. Uh, Nobody's gonna give you a hundred and fifty million dollar contract for missing wide open layups. I'm sorry, it's not gonna happen. And and you know what? I I, I don't got nothing against women or or the sport or whatever. But you you can't compare that to what the NBA has gone through. The the WNBA is how many years old? It's less than twenty years old, probably, right? Yeah, yeah. I think they're right around, right around that twenty. So year you're, mark. you're twenty years 20, old, and you know you you still have to build a brand. You still have to build a league. When the NBA was 20 years old, players weren't making the money that they're making now. Yeah. So you have to progress and grow the same way the NBA did. You have to create uh, the show and make the fans want to come out and see you the same way the NBA did. I mean, let's be honest. I watched a, I watched a highlight. Uh, <laughs> a, w, a WNBA <laughs> highlight. They had a highlight of a girl doing a 360 layup. Like, it was just all by herself. Just like, you didn't even have to do that, ma'am. You could have just <laughs> gone ahead and tossed it up. HGTV. Like, like, one of their highlights is, ooh, she dribbled to the left, <laughs> dribbled to the right. I don't understand, like, how dribbling is a highlight. I'd rather see a Steph Curry three than a Britney Griner dunk. Because they, they get so they get so low off the ground. <laughs> so why? I, I don't, listen, why? Because it's you, you, you see, you see a lot of Steph Curry threes. No, I mean, I'm, I'm with you guys. I'm with you guys in saying that it the is economics. But at I mean, least he's shimmy at his three. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean <laughs> to see uh, Brittany Carter dunk might be exciting. Like it <laughs> might be worthwhile. Looking I was at adding that. some levity to the situation. I, I, but I this also want to see a two handed three shot. Like no, if it takes all your power just to put up a three pointer, you need to go in the weight room, Madam Sir. I just don't understand. I'm not gonna laugh at that because that's not funny. So listen, man. That's extremely funny, and I agree with him. I don't want to see nobody do. Doing this, talking about they need a hundred and fifty million contract. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Let's not make light of gender uh, pay inequities based on gender. That's a real issue. Okay, and all then, right, Cap. Oh, no, listen, listen. <laughs> Damn, I didn't even finish my, my statement. Did I, did I finish my well, statement? Well, I saw your cape flowing in the no, wind. You didn't. So I want you to go <laughs> you, you, See, that's your problem. You need to, you need to listen more. You're always waiting to talk. Listen. Uh -huh. So, gender inequity, gender pay inequity is a real thing, but this is not the front to be fighting this on. This is purely a capitalistic argument. They don't generate as much uh, revenue 
We, you, that point has already been made. And another point is that I feel like the WNBA, they lose money in the WNBA. Like, yeah. they're not even bringing in, uh, the, the owners are taking a hit, you know? So it's not like, what, what, you need a percentage of the loss? That, you want a higher percentage of the loss? Yeah, you want to make less money? Like, it's, it's, right. this, is, this is purely a capitalistic argument. This is not about gender inequities at large, you know? So, so, so I think we can all agree that the e- economics of the WNBA argument isn't there, but I think we all can also agree that the uh, underlying argument of gender pay inequality is an issue. All right. I mean, yeah, nobody's absolutely. fighting against that. Well, but, of so, course. So then, I wouldn't. Th- I wouldn't say in this situation though. No, because what the, 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 if, if you if you say it like this, it's one thing to say that in you know the professional realm of you know legal engineering and those things, but the the athleticism difference in 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 the, in the sport itself. I mean, I don't. I don't. I don't well, think there's a gap. I think, I think that nobody's nobody in the WNBA is running down the court in three seconds. Okay, so I got you. We're off the WNBA. I, I hear you, but don't you think that the the, the although we were talked about it, the excuses for all the, the women can't make as much in the WNBA have been spun to justify why, why women can't make much as much. Period. Like I've heard arguments that women can't make as much as men because they might go into labor, they might give birth, they are crazy, they're temperamental. Like the idea that we're constantly making excuses for why women can't make as much as men and trying to justify it. I get the economics of the WNBA. I understand that point. But to the point that you don't want to watch a layup because it's not exciting or you don't want to watch a Brittany Griner dunk, that one I don't get. I mean, it's not exciting to you, but I, I don't get I, get... I get the economics. Wait, wait, like, wait, wait, wait. W- women don't even I mean, watch the WNBA <laughs> exactly. like, because know. it's not exciting to them. I don't know nope, the stats, nope. but I'm saying... Across she, the, I can tell you the stats. The, the, Zero. The idea is that Zero people are, want on, to on, watch on, women on. The idea do is this We are making excuses long. again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, you, you can't... So, you, so, you can't so, condition so, yourself to like something that's not exciting. You like can. You, you listen. This the market demands that you present a product that people want. You can't just force a product on people that they don't want. Is that because only so many times listen, you can watch somebody and, jump and, 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 I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm elevating. I'm leaving the WNBA because I agree with you, but I'm saying just across the board, making excuses then, for what women can't. They're notable exceptions though. Nice. Danica Patrick was like top no, top seven earners in the indie. Serena Williams is one of the top earners in tennis, uh, 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 a lot more than her male counterparts. So there are caveats. This is purely about. Capitalism. This is yeah. not about. This is not the front not, to be fighting the war yeah. about gender uh, pay inequities. Hold on. How can you choose the front? How can you tell me you don't? Because because that's what they do to black people all the time. Hey, don't protest like this. Protest like that. Because don't, there's a qualitative on, analysis. Don't, let me finish. Yeah. don't do this like this. Do it like that. So yeah, I get you. We're getting uh, this argument about uh, Brittany Griner or Asian Asia, whoever she is. But we are still in some ways saying you can't make as much as me because you're not as good as me. The difference is subjective versus objective analysis. It's actual in, measurable. In, 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 when you're talking about athletics, that is by and large a subjective uh, analysis of things. Who likes something more than yeah. they like something else? When you're talking about women in the workplace, it when they say something like, oh, uh, they may get pregnant, well, there, there's, that's, that's, there's nothing objective about that. I mean, it's there's, it can happen. Right. The, <laughs> when you talk about the work that they pr- produce while working, it's equivalent to the man. Yeah. So it's there's measurable, it's, it's right. Measurable. There, there's a quantitative yeah. analysis that's there that that isn't there in athletics. So th- you're comparing apples to oranges when you're talking about women in sports versus women in the in the workplace. In the workplace. Yeah. Because one deals with something that you can test. I can put a man against a woman in in any office setting and say, okay, you are probably going to be equal. Not it, it, the the. The measurement that I use is based off of your ability to do the work yeah. and not your ability to be a man or be a woman yeah. versus athletics where you know by and large that every man is going to be athletically superior to every woman. So it's a matter of, well, do I just still like looking at women do their athletics? But I, I've told you guys, I've talked about the idea that we're still making excuses for why women can't make as much as men. Is that an I understand the economics of the WNBA. I get that point. I understand what you're saying, but at what point do we allow the fight to take place? That's all I'm, that's all I'm saying. And all, I'm bringing to the point the point that we're laughing at playing, but I we're still... That's a terrible point. No, no. That. So, so to answer yeah. what he's saying, I think the point that you can argue with is when they start to generate the revenue that says, hey, we, we're here and we can do, we can, uh, you know... We can bring in or we can create the same type of entertainment that they can create. But they, they haven't generated the revenue or the the attention from, from fans to say that yet. Well, right. every athlete gets thirsty. And sometimes you have to take a sip of white tears in order to quench that thirst. And 
Now we take a sip of those white tears in terms of Caucasian Americans calling the cops at every turn on black Americans, regardless of if they're trying to get in the swimming pool with socks, if they're selling lemonade, lemonade uh, down mowing the street, the grass. if they're mowing the lawn, um, if they're now we just had someone who actually died as a result of this because a young young man was uh, popping firecrackers. Um, uh, his neighbor came out, told him to stop. They got into it. Neighbor ends up pulling a gun on him and shooting him. The neighbor argued and said, oh, he was he was lunging at me. They come back out with uh, video footage, and it shows he's actually, the, the, the young black kid was actually turning away from him, trying to run away from this gun, gun being shot at him. So we've escalated the situation from just calls of, of aggravation to active animus. Um, <clears throat> I mean, what, what do we have to do well, here's a better question. Should, how how much should we penalize somebody for a frivolous 911 call? Quite honestly, I think at this point, at minimum, it should be a misdemeanor. At most, we should probably get into yeah. like a lower level felony. Now, you know, you're a lawyer. You know, the, well, you know the bar for prosecuting somebody for making a 911 call for a situation they feel in earnest warrants a 911 call. I, what's the what's the don't you have that like we got mens rea what's that well there's you gotta have you, you gotta have some kind of ma malice of forethought or something going on here right like you no, can't not necessarily you can't when you talk about when you talk about negligent negligent uh behavior you can have criminally negligent homicide that doesn't require um intent behind it i'm so sure elements are exceedingly difficult to meet for that well, Someone, no, not, not really. So, so the, the public policy is you don't want to penalize people for to not call the cops, right? And and, that, and that's that's and I'm not, I don't want to talk about this right now, but that is the same parallelism you hear between why they don't prosecute women for making false claims about sexual which assault, which we're going to talk about. Um, is you don't want to penalize the public for to to call the cops for whatever reason. Now. Um, obviously, we all agree that what they're calling the cops for ain't a crime. Most of it is just racism, but this isn't new. I mean, the cops have been used to enforce this kind of crap against black people for a long time, and, and, that, and that's worked for a long time. What is new now is that, well, we see, we see the, the, the silliness of Facebook. Like, before, it would be your people telling you they did this, and you tell your friends who aren't black, they're like, no, of course not. You must have done something different. You must have said something, or you must have had some reason to come out there. And now on Facebook, we see, no, you were just mowing the grass, and you were just selling lemonade. Um, I, 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 hear what, I, I agree with everything we're saying. I don't think we're going to disagree on that point. Um, I, what to, to be able to file charges against them, I don't think it's ever going to happen. I think, I think I we should, you know, and, and I think I see your wife actually commenting saying it'll never happen. We don't want to scare people off dialing 911. Right. Quite honestly, people that are literally afraid for their lives are not are going not to hesitate. Be scared, like, yeah. Oh, you know what? I got a gun to my head. Yeah. Let, me, let me wonder if, I'm gonna, if, if this is actually going to be something worth calling for. We know what's worth calling 911 for. Yeah. And if you don't know, then you probably shouldn't be calling 911 well, in the first place. You give the general well, public that much credit? No, no, because you call... You think, I, I th it's, yeah, it's one I thing to call 911 because it's a gun to me, but what they're saying is before it escalates. It's also okay to call the cops if you think something's escalating and you don't want to get to a point of a gun's point pouring at you. Yeah, I get you. A gun to me... But I, people, I think these, some of these situations, like, like, like say, the, say the girl selling water, I don't even think that situation would escalate. I think if that woman came down... And knowing, like, what Brennan's saying, I could be charged for a misdemeanor if I call the cops and they find no uh, valid reason for me to have called them. I don't think, I think the woman would keep walking by and mind her business because she wouldn't, she, the reason she called the cops is because she didn't want to get into a situation that would escalate to where she possibly might have to defend herself. So I feel like, yeah, I feel like it's getting so ridiculous now that there has to be some type of measure put into place to say you will be penalized if you call us for some frivolous reasons. So so let me get this right. Y'all think that this is some something new? You think that exactly. the no, police yeah, is, what, what's what's happening is the phenomenon is that we we it's it's it's, it's viewership bias. We can yeah. see it happening because everyone is equipped with a camera now. But it's I, I bet you we could analyze the data, it's happening far less than it used to happen. Because there is some disincentive for the police not to kill people when the cameras are rolling. And I'll say this, right? So, you know, how 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 are you gonna hold some, how are you going to put the onus on the layperson to be able to de-escalate the situation and tie it into a police officer whose job is to de-escalate the situation? And you mean to tell me I'm liable for making a phone call when you chose to fire a gun? It escalated that far? 
to where you killed somebody and I'm, and I'm somehow reli- liable for making a frivolous phone call? I don't, I don't understand but, what you're yeah, saying yeah, right yeah, now. What are you, so, what are you so, even talking about? Yeah, listen, yeah, listen, that's just a, that was just think, a stupid thing to if, do, to kill somebody I, over an argument. Listen, of, argument if a police a officer who's supposed to be trained to de-escalate situation is in a situation, right? And he, he encounters the person who you called the 911 on, the lay person, who's not trained to do so, who's not trained to assess the situation, the severity per se. They may just want to call the cops to de-escalate, call the cops because they want to prevent something from happening, et cetera, et cetera, or they feel their life is in danger. But how are you going to put more responsibility on the person who made a call to bring bring the officer who's trained to de-escalate for him shooting somebody unwarrantedly? I see what you just did. You actually, um, you actually confused the facts. So... A police officer did not shoot this boy with a firecracker. A it was the neighbor, the neighbor that shot. actually that actually yeah. shot. So, so either way, but no, it's not either way. No, no, because, it's, it's, so, because you're talking about something that did not happen. So take away the training, right? It is still how are you going to put the onus on the person who called the call for help, right? Regardless of whether they called for help and it was warranted or not, they I, you can't argue whether that person felt what? that they needed. Let me, you, you, you no. rarely let somebody finish the point, so you always going to. Well, you've already said it no, three you times. Let me finish my point. So say it for a fourth time, and I'll wait. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, I relinquish the, the, the floor to this gentleman. With no, the, no, the no, I, head, but... I, I, I get what you said, but like you, I, I kind of agree with yeah. Brennan. At, at this, I think what Brennan's saying and what I what I feel like is we are all we should all understand when it's time to call the police and when it's not. And I feel like if you walk past somebody selling water on the street and you don't see them with a business license, uh, it's not it's none of your business. Let 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 the law deal with that. What, what it sounds like you're saying is, how do we hold responsible people for a situation escalating when they made the phone call within a situation that did not necessitate a phone call to begin with? Yeah. You, are, you are now almost victimizing the, the, the agitator in this situation. They made a call. Mostly with the people that we're talking about with these ridiculous phone calls, you're, you're calling the cops on children selling liquid on the sidewalk that does not require you to call the police and say hey we've got some things going on here (laughs) you're calling cops on people that have a barbecue pit in a park that is not something that requires excuse me officer I think some shit is going down over here with this barbecue pit. <laughs> they got a park so range. So when you talk about escalating a situation, you cannot take the onus off of these agitators for putting themselves into business that is not theirs to begin with. If some, if if you saw somebody, you know, hey, I see somebody beating the shit out of somebody. Oh, we'll be there right yeah, away. Exactly. Hey, I see somebody that that has a gun out. We'll be there right away. Hey, I even see somebody ha- having a heated argument, and I don't know what it's going to go to. We'll be there right away. Not, hey, I see some really thirsty people, and they look mighty dangerous to be this thirsty. <laughs> there are some things that you should know that are within the reasonable bounds of of a reasonable person that you have to hold some accountability for. And if you can't, then you should be penalized for not being smart enough to understand a situation. That's a whole bunch of bullshit because at the end of the day, it's not about whether the person who made the call was mistaken in making the call. We all agree that these are frivolous calls. That's not the point. We're talking about putting responsibility, legal consequence on a person who makes a phone call, in most cases to a police officer who was trained to de-escalate and decide in that situation what to do next. Not that that person isn't deciding themselves to do Take an action. They they called the person who the public has designated to make those type of decisions. That's not all the time true though, because the the, the police is not the designated public person for all these situations that are happening. Like the situation with the barbecue at the park, the the lady specifically said, "There's a number you call if you see somebody uh, out here uh, violating park rules." That's not, not the, the point police. I'm making. I agree with that. What I'm saying, the frivolity of the call does not matter. They cannot be. They shouldn't be held responsible for the the actions of somebody. Who comes and intervenes in that situation? And they're, especially when they're designated by the public, like a police officer, to de-escalate situations or to determine what happens next. That's not the person who makes the phone call decision. You know what? I'm getting tired of this conversation. So tired that I want to go to sleep. But if I go to sleep, I might snore. And if I start snoring, that means I might be suffering from sleep apnea, which... I've actually gone to the doctor for it, and they told me I have severe obstructive sleep apnea. So every woman that I've ever slept next to, I apologize. And every woman that I will uh, sleep next to in the future, I'm working on it. I really am. Don't forget uh, about the men. Don't forget about the men now. Damon, 
You slept next to me. <laughs> that's, a, that's a lie. Oh, that's a lie. Slept, oh, that's a lie. Oh, man. That's a lie, sir. <laughs> I want to sit on that side of the table next to me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's a lie. So, um, Doc, what's your favorite Doc? Uh, favorite Doc? Favorite Doc? Uh, favorite Doc? Favorite Doc? Favorite Doc? Tell us how important it is, or tell us how dangerous sleep apnea is, if 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 it's dangerous at all, and um, what are the best solutions? Because I think we had this conversation before, and I'm hard pressed to want to get surgery to try to correct this. And the doc was telling me, uh, get a CPAP machine. I'm like, look, I don't want treatment; I want curative measures. And for me. I believe that the, the the best way to get that curative measure is for you to go break my nose, uh, scrape some shit out, do whatever you got to do to try to fix it surgically. Uh, what do you think? Ross and he'll do that right here tonight. You don't want to see me. <laughs> Ross said, yes, he does. <laughs> Listen, first of all, I was the doctor who gave you initial recommendations to forego surgery. Well, give that man his props. <laughs> Uh, so, but I don't want to <laughs> forego. <laughs> All right, we we'll go ahead. You know, not to be corny and employ a pun, but OSAL obstructive sleep apnea is very slept on disease. Um, it's very dangerous. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of uh, potentially lethal consequences to it. Um, I wasn't prepared to, you know, uh, give a diatribe on this, but you know, it's pretty pretty dangerous. Um, you want to get surgery, but the surgery actually is not necessarily curative in most of the cases. You think you've been watching a lot of TV and you think that just taking something out is going to cure you, but you could, you could, you could encounter some more adverse consequences by doing that. I think you going to get the sleep test and uh, the sleep study and getting the fitting for the CPAP was an excellent option. I think you can control most of the untoward consequences of that by doing that. It's a little inconvenient, but it's worth it. What, but on Doogie Howser, what, 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 uh, <laughs> what are the consequences? So, so, so I'm trying to, let me come try to translate this. So pulmonary hypertension is a condition whereby, you know, you, you're, the, the pulmonary, the, the, the heart is pumping so hard to get the blood into the lungs because of the, the, the when, when someone becomes uh, hypoxic or they have low oxygen content in their blood, from secondary to sleep apnea, the lungs paradoxically like to tighten up and squeeze down on the areas that are not getting blood. So the pressure that go that the pressure of the blood flowing through the lungs goes up, so the heart has to pump harder against it. So over time the heart has to pump harder and harder, and just like anybody working out their muscles, the heart gets bigger and bigger. And when the heart is not a certain geometry, it doesn't squeeze well. So it, it causes dysfunction of the right side of your heart. I'm trying to break this down as, as much as I possibly can. It has a whole bunch of other different consequences as well. Um, yeah. Not to mention all of the traumatic injuries you might in, uh, encounter when you fall asleep driving at the wheel, which is how a lot of people present to the emergency department when, you know, you, you, you don't get adequate sleep throughout the day because adequate uh, rest throughout the night because you're intermittently waking up uh, because you're not breathing or not breathing enough. So ultimately you wake up thinking you got eight hours of sleep, but you really didn't got effectively two hours of sleep. So you walk around and you're tired, you're falling asleep driving to work, you've, and that's how a lot of people present to the emergency department. So it's really dangerous. Huh. You know, I think I've had that all my life, but it's okay. It's like yeah. it's actually a parish man tradition. We all we all have it pretty bad, I guess. I don't know. I snore like crazy, but my wife don't care, so that's good enough for me. I thought Thank you me. just had Thanks a fat man. accent. Yeah, yeah, man, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's okay, boss. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But hey, man, enjoy um, your CPAP machine. And, and you you enjoy not living much longer. That's all right. So. <laughs> oh, oh, man. My, my, my little man right there is good to go, so I've, I've secured my seed. Good, How about good. You? you know, we should talk about that one day, about uh, future planning. That's, that's not what we do enough, but we'll, we'll leave that for another day. I um, wanted to talk about, I don't know if we have enough time to talk about it, um, Toxic masculinity. Do we have enough time to talk no, about that? No. No? no okay. We need so, two weeks. Psychic? What <laughs> well, do you say? No. Well, then, um, real quick, we're going to call across the pond real quick, and then we'll uh, end with our black magic for the day. Um, Ethiopia and Eritrea uh, have ended war. Uh, they've been at war, well, from, two from 1998 to 2000, they had, a, they, were, they, they had a war going on. This was, for, for, for all intents and purposes, a boundary dispute um, where you know, they were arguing over um, land, land boundaries and saying, hey, you're, you're taking stuff that belongs to us. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't do it. it. I mean, this war ended between 70,000 70, to 100,000 people uh, died within that two-year span. Uh, they ended up coming to an uh, armistice and a, and a peace treaty agreement um, in 2000, which was ratified in 2002 by uh, various 
uh, United Nations organizations, but <clears throat> Ethiopia decided not to, uh, to, to, to live by the peace treaty. Uh, so since then, they have been in this almost Cold War status. Uh, people have had to exodus from, from, the, uh, from the countries because of the uh, high tensions. And <laughs> black people, <laughs> black people, um, black people in these countries have, have have been really stressed out. You know, and in these two countries are ethnically virtually the same. I mean, they're beautiful people. Uh, beautiful, beautiful people. Beautiful culture. Right? Um, yeah. And so Gorgeous. just now, yeah, they said, you know what? That both leaders, uh, the prime minister, I think it's the prime minister of Ethiopia and the president of Eritrea. I might have those two switched up. Uh, almost out the blue, said, hey, you know what? We're going to end this and and get back together. I love to see black love. Yeah, absolutely. And and I feel like this is one of those instances where uh, even though they're in the, the horn of Africa, uh, everybody doesn't necessarily consider them to be black, which is stupid in and of itself. Who, 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 um, who, 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 you, know, you know how people say, oh, those are, those are really... I've never you know, heard that before. Uh, 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 Arabic, Middle Easterners, Arabic, Arabics, black, and all, yeah. that, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, hey, oh hey, black is black to me. But kudos to them. Anybody have any thoughts on that? No, nope. I do. I, I think that at this point in time, we've seen enough border wars that everybody should learn that, man, if 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 you just learn to get along and figure out who what the strengths are and work together, everybody can benefit from it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like, and I want to say this to Houston, man. Stop this north and south side shit. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. nah. <laughs> Stop this, man. I've been here for seven years. And every time I, when I was living on the south, it was, man, you live on the south. When I was living on the north, man, you live on the north. Y'all all Houston. Uh, like, yeah, but North Side sucks. North Side sucks. See, so. this is what I'm talking about. I got a lot of hate in y'all. So I don't understand I'm just telling you how, how the truth of the matter is, is South North Side, South. where I'm from, is where it's at. But this is the fourth North largest sucks. city in America, and with all the resources, the talent y'all have here, y'all should have yeah. a more prominent music scene. Y'all should have a lot more things going, but y'all hate on each other too well, much. Look, look, I will never outcast a North Sider. I'm just saying they suck. That's just, I don't know if that's the same thing or not, but anyway. Well, I appreciate uh, the international Rodney King, Rodney Shake over here. For, for for giving us that little spiel, but uh, <laughs> uh, just want to get into Black Magic real quick. Um, Lieutenant General Daryl Williams was just um, named the newest superintendent for West Point. Uh, he is a 1983 U.S. Military Academy graduate. Uh, he is the first Black superintendent that West Point has had in its 216 year it, uh, existence. Uh, he has served as Deputy Chief of Staff for the U.S. Army in Europe and the Deputy Commanding General for support uh, for the 2nd Infantry Division in South Korea. Most recently, um, Lieutenant General Williams was commander of NATO's Allied Land Command based in Turkey. We salute you and your achievement um, in the field of military uh, pursuits, Lieutenant General Daryl Williams. And, I mean, it makes me proud to see to see us surviving when the odds are so so stacked so, against i mean yeah. 216 years and we finally get one in that position i mean it's it's it seems unreal it's crazy man and we still this far along and we talking about the first black of anything this yeah, but like you say when it happens man yeah you well, should well, 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 also it, it might also skin. it might also depend <laughs> on <laughs> you probably light you know, skin on mix. I don't, <laughs> i'm not buying it to, to answer your, your that you say it might also depend on how many superintendents they've had they've, they've had, had 60. If, He's the 60th of his name. Pull him up, man. Pull him up. I want to see his complexion. Uh, this is that crab. Uh, no, uh, no, because uh, listen, he, 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 he says he's black. He's good enough for me. Man, look, I don't man. care what you so, want to describe so the man. Oh, that's that's that, brother, was right? was yeah, Obama yeah. not black enough? Because Obama saying, was white. I mean, Obama was black. If the black man with says guys, he's black, black with a cat. What? Come on, man. Oh, man. Let me talk about that next time. Oh, my God. Sometimes you just disgust me as a human. But this is him. He he's he might be on the lighter side of nah, black, he's, but he's brother, but he's a regular he's Negro. Yeah. I gotta hear him speak first though. You uh, have that, that sellout I, twang. What what does that even mean? You never heard you never heard like Tim Scott talk from South Carolina? Uh, that's are, a that's are a you one of those prototypical that say talk white. No no he not talk sell white. Out twang. Sell out twang. That's what I said. Which sounds like the equivalent of Paris Denard. You, you go look at all the sellouts on Fox. They have the sellout twang. Go just go research it. Watch. <laughs> Do you think Ben Carson has a sellout twang? No, he doesn't. Yeah. No, Everybody no. can't speak. He, does, he is crazy though. He's, he is, he's nuts. Everybody can't speak with the same ethnic veracity as you, uh, Rod. So, um, 
That's our time, ladies and gentlemen, on intelligence. I've had a great time with you fellas. Um, hashtag, hashtag, <laughs> hashtag talk black. Um, make sure. Y'all season tickets for TSU and PV this year. PV. TSU. Savannah, Savannah State. South Carolina South State. Carolina State. State. No, no one cares about South Carolina. But, hey, sir. Uh, what sir. Gamecocks. What kind of name is Gamecock? That's the dumbest name I've ever heard in my life. Sir, you don't even know what color your school is. <laughs> so stop yeah. it. What are you talking about? You don't know what your school color is. Black and gold, sir. So Xavier stop you right there. Oh, no, you messed up. It's Xavier. 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 University of Louisiana. So anyway, um, hope, you, hope you guys have liked the show. If you like it and you love it, make sure to share it on your social media. Uh, we are trying to get these views up as we continue to build out the show uh, the next several weeks. I promise you we're, we're talking about it, but I promise you in the background we're working hard. Um, we're going to have two different platforms. One, the social media platform where you see all of the raw content as you see it right now. On the website, it's going to be a much more polished version. You'll see graphics behind us, all those shenanigans. So uh, we are we are working around the clock to try to get this up for you guys. Um, but in the, in the interim, we want you guys to share it because as we build, we want to grow. And the more we grow, the more viewers we get, the more viewers we get, the more money we make, the more money we make, the better we can make this. And then you can see us on Netflix and, and HBO and all that jazz. Like black athletes. Sorry. Almost. I'm trying to get invited to Fox one day to keep it real. Say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, little bit, where, where's Lil Damon at? He's, he's, he's on the sofa relaxing. Okay, well, we didn't want him here anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you later, ladies and gentlemen. Bye bye.